Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us again today for what is our sixth episode of the live cast for Adapting the Future of Jewish Education. And I'm particularly excited today to be, enjoy, be joined by my friend and colleague, Saul Kaiserman, in a discussion about surviving or thriving in Jewish education with a particular emphasis on what's happening in Hebrew school, or is that congregational school, or supplementary school, or Sunday school? We'll explore all of those names as we move through today's conversation. Um, I am David Breifman. I'm the CEO at the Jewish Education Project, and we are a New York-based agency with an extending footprint nationally. And what we are trying to do is inspire and empower Jewish educators everywhere to create transformative Jewish educational experiences. We work with Jewish educators every single day, and particularly during this pandemic, the impact that we're having is felt by people far, far away as the digital world increases its reach all the time. A few weeks ago, we decided to have these live cast episodes where we're interviewing some, um, some of the people that are making a real difference in Jewish education. And today with having Saul on, we managed to continue that. A few technical notes, and then we'll get really stuck into the conversation. For those of you who are with us here on Zoom, you can ask us any questions you like in the Q&A box, and we will try and answer as many of them as we can, particularly in the second half of today's conversation. While you're in the chat function now, if you want to introduce yourselves and say hi, who you are, where you're from, that would be great for us to be able to see that as well, just to you know, create a bit more atmosphere amongst this virtual community. Um, all of these broadcasts are going to be recorded. So if you or your colleagues particularly like something you hear, you can have a look at them later on. And now I guess it's without further ado that I want to introduce to you Saul Kaiserman, who is the Director of Lifelong Learning at Congregation Emmanuel of the City of New York. And he also happens to be a board member of the Jewish Education Project. So I get to spend a bit of time with Saul talking about these and other issues as well. So I'm gonna welcome Saul to us today and I'm gonna kick us off with a few questions. And at the moment, I can't see him. I know he's there, but I'm gonna ask him to make sure his camera is on so all of us can see Saul. Okay, Saul, can you hear us? Well, he should be here. So I'm just gonna talk a bit longer while I get to see and hear Saul pop in. And while we're having these few technical glitches, which sort of sums up some of what we're all experiencing in this Corona moment, I'm gonna make sure that we keep on having this conversation moving live as we continue today. So one of the things that was really behind today's conversation with Saul was really trying to get to some of the discussions around Hebrew school, which to be fair, aren't always so favorable. And considering it's the place where the majority of our Jewish students get their primary form of Jewish education in this country, we thought it was only right to be able to have Saul come and talk to us all about what's taking place in this environment. So that's why we've got him coming on, although he's still not here. What am I gonna do? I will manage to keep talking about some of these issues as we, as we move on. So we're in the midst of this pandemic. Yesterday was marking 100 days of all of us um, being relatively, you know, around the same time um, in this self, um, self shelter, shelter at home state of being. And it was um, yesterday when I was able to really reflect on what 100 days being away from all of our colleagues in the workplace actually meant and to evaluate have we been successful or have we really, um, have we really tried to, to do some more things as we come out and achieve new, um, new boundaries in this time period? It's also important to note that we're now recording this one week after our special episode, which was last week on race and Jewish education, which by far attracted the largest number of people who have had listening to our livecast. The resources that we put up online as a result of the, that broadcast have been really accessed by a whole lot of people. And to note that in some people's language, we are now going through two pandemics and really to suggest that the Jewish world is going to look completely different as we come out of the Corona pandemic 
Now we're talking about issues of race, like perhaps we haven't done before, is also going to be um, a really new experience for many of us um, as we come out in what many people are referring to as the new normal. So with that as the backdrop for this conversation today, um, let me just say a couple of things which I think are really worthwhile pointing out um, as Saul pops on live as we begin to see him and he can hear us. So say hi, Saul. Hi, can you hear me okay? I'm, I, I had to call in from my phone. I'm, I'm having some sort of, I've never had technical problems before. With, Amazing. With you could be the first Jewish educator never to have had technical problems before. Um, so I've just done a really elaborate introduction, but there's one thing I am going to say based on what I just said to everybody, which is important to hear. Um, when Saul and I were prepping for this call and noting that this came one week after our discussion about race and Jewish education, you might also notice this is my first interview for those who've been following me for all five weeks. Um, this is my first interview with one-on-one um, -on -one with the other person being someone who identifies as male. And Saul and I were very cognizant of the fact that now you're going to have two white men talking about Jewish education. What makes this even more complicated is Saul and I are two white Jewish guys talking about Jewish education in a field which is largely um, populated and employing people who are not male identifying. So it's an interesting conversation for us to be having. We're very cognizant of that fact. And maybe I wanted to throw it out before even getting to the introduction. So how are you feeling like being a being this male Jewish educator talking on behalf of a field which is so dominated by women um, in the workforce. I mean, first of all, thank you for having me on as a congregational educator, because I think that congregational educators, I think I'll speak for everyone in my field, feel like we're often excluded from any of these conversations that involve leadership and involve vision. Um, certainly, I've seen in my limited role, like the hiring decisions I've made, the support that I've given to people who work for me that I've tried to really um, both be very cognizant of my own privilege and, and the ways that my own story has involved certain opportunities that maybe were not available to others. Um, definitely in the current context, I'm thinking about the kinds of privilege that allow me to be on, you know, just pick up a phone right now and continue this conversation when my laptop's not working. Um, there's a lot that's embedded in that. And uh, so I would say that, you know, we all have a responsibility to be looking at the ways that the systems that we're embedded in sometimes maybe advantage some in, the fa in, in, in favor of others. And um, while women play a, a very large role in the field of Jewish education, it's, it's not clear to me the degree to which um, the fact that congregational educators are excluded from the conversation as much doesn't perhaps have a gender related bias against women in the first place. And so I would just want to name that. Okay, so let's use that as our starting point and keep that in the background that we are cognizant of this conversation we're having. But Saul, let's take a bit of a step back. Let's tell us where you're currently located, what work you're doing. Tell us a bit about your family as well, um, just to situate ourselves for this conversation now. So I would say that, you know, probably the, the oh, hang on a second. Would you like me to try and come back in with uh, my computer now? Let's see. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I feel a little more comfortable doing it like that. Keep <laughs> going, Paul. Well, tell us about back. yourself. Uh, well, you can see I'm on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in our uh, two bedroom, one bathroom apartment. We feel lucky to have this much space for the four of us in a way that I think we've always felt crowded up until now. Um, I am the director of lifelong learning at Temple Emanuel, which is a large reform synagogue on the east side of Manhattan. And so I'd say my wife and I also feel very fortunate that we're able to continue to be gainfully employed and working from home under the current circumstances. Uh, we have two daughters living in the apartment with us. The older one, Jory, just became a bat mitzvah via Zoom this past uh, like two weeks ago. And um, I'd be happy to talk more about that with anybody who's interested. It was a great experience. Uh, my younger daughter, Ziva, attends Schechter, Manhattan, a fantastic uh, day school here on the uh, thank you for the mazel tovs. That's very sweet. Um, uh, a great progressive day school here on the uh, west side. And my older daughter is a student at Riverside School for Makers and Artists, which is a public school on the west side uh, in the 60s. Okay. Um, 
Is that I, I'm, I'm a little discombobulated because of the technology, but uh, don't worry about it. I'll, can, I'll ask... carry you through on this one, so we're good. Um, so look, I'm talking to Saul now partly because of his role as a um, in Jewish education in a major congregation in New York. But Saul's background in Jewish education is far broader than just that. And what I'm going to ask him to tell you a bit about his Jewish educational trajectory is because I think you're all going to hear that what he talks about today is reflective, not just of congregational learning, but some of the bigger picture issues taking place. So give us your Jewish educational bio. Where have you been? What are you doing? So um, let me say that like I come from like a, on my mother's side, a lineage of Hasidic rabbis, um, which um, I don't think was an uninterrupted flow. We were um, kind of a family that was not extraordinarily Jewishly active. When I was a kid, we belonged to a reform congregation. I was one of those kids who hated religious school and kind of said to the teachers and the principal, you know, um, this is this is a big waste of time. Like anyone could do better than this and was sort of challenged. Well, if you think you could do a better job, why don't you? And I I guess that to some degree that influenced my life uh, and the choice of career was that challenge. But I'd say more influential than my religious school education was um, my experience of youth group. I grew up in New York City in Crafty, uh, the Reformed Jewish Youth Movement. And um, I think that I found in youth grouping for the first time, the kinds of values that my parents were, were latching onto of, you know, that were in the songs of Pete Seeger or the Weavers or Simon and Garfunkel um, represented um, in Jewish life, in Jewish prayer and Jewish song. Um, and that kind of gave me the bug, I guess. And uh, I started working as a song leader and working at summer camps and um, ended up uh, as, a, as a grad student at the, the Davidson School at the Jewish Theological Seminary. At the time, they were doing free scholarships for folks who were enrolled in the program. And I was very glad to um, give it a try, like kind of as a chance, and I loved it. I worked part-time as the principal of a small synagogue in Westchester, the free synagogue in Mount Vernon. And it was a fantastic experience. Um, but when, when I was at Davidson, they didn't have a strong like supplementary school track. Um, oh, Susan, thank you. Yes, Camp Coleman was a big piece of that part of my life too. David asked me to do this quickly. I can't speak to every piece of the things that, that really inspired me and that I, I was shaped by, um, including my experiences working for three summers in the South um, as a New Yorker. Um, uh, Davidson had a terrific day school track, however, that was headed up by Carol Engel. And so part of that, degree was working in a day school. I worked for three years at Schechter Manhattan, the school where uh, my younger daughter now attends, my older daughter previously attended, um, a great progressive constructivist environment. Um, but then Central Synagogue, another large Manhattan congregation opened up um, their a search for a religious school principal position. Um, and, you know, I had always felt that supplementary schooling had a great deal of potential and was um, just not invested in with the right kinds of supports. And uh, I would say Central took a big risk on hiring me as kind of, you know, young and, and not really tested in any kind of a big congregational environment. And um, that kind of risk taking, I think, is the kind of thing that congregations need to do more of and that Central continues to be really good at. Um, and and uh, that kind of started me really thinking more broadly and deeply about Jewish education in the supplementary school environment than I ever had before. Um, I, I worked there for three years and in the third year we started a program of full time teachers uh, working for the as the religious school teachers and, and kind of shaping the life of uh, families in the congregation. Um, it's a model that is now started to be replicated in some other institutions. I think it's a great model. Um, I did two years after that in Israel at the Mandel Jerusalem Fellows, uh, studying educational change in congregational settings, uh, largely because I was following my wife Liz out there when she was studying uh, um, in, in Jerusalem. Um, and then on my return, I, I was hired by Temple Emmanuel to run their educational programs, again, particularly targeting students and religious school aged and teens and families. And this is now 13 years that I've been at Temple Emmanuel working to try and help a, a large urban congregation that in many ways is, you know, sees itself as, as um, the vanguard of reform Judaism, not the bleeding edge, but kind of the, 
the, the institution itself of reform Judaism helping us to rethink what, what's possible with education. I know that was a long answer, I'm sorry. So let's put it all together because I think part of it is getting to the crux of the question, which sometimes I've asked my guests towards the end of these broadcasts. I really wanna try and go, let's get your one sentence answer to this question. What's the purpose of Jewish education? Well, I'd say Jewish educators are culture builders. Um, we're the people who are connecting um, our heritage, uh, uh, looking back at the past and saying, there's real Jewish wisdom that we can learn from, but also thinking about the future with an eye towards tikkun olam, what needs to be changed? What kind of world are we trying to build? And Jewish educators are teachers who stand in the middle of that with a sense of mindfulness and presence saying, we're responsible to our legacy and we're responsible to our heritage and we need to help bring others along in looking at the past towards what what do we want the future to look like all right so let's begin to drill down on this because it's going to get to the crux of the conversation we'll just hit it a bit a bit hard to start off with now for those listening out there you've got to understand that i'm asking all of these questions um with the benefit of a lot of love um, and a lot of respect, but I'm going to try and talk about some of the things that we often hear about Hebrew school, which give it a bad rap in many situations. And what I want to try and do with Saul is uncover, like, there is such a thing as bad education. There's such, such a thing as good education. What I want to talk about today is, like, when good education takes place in supplementary school, what can we all be doing to really give it the rap that it deserves when it's doing something right? So whether it's Hebrew school or Sunday school, the... The trope goes something like this. We put kids after school or on a Sunday morning when they least want to be there, learning things that are completely irrelevant to their lives, um, practicing prayers, which they may or may not use later on, teaching them how to decode Hebrew, maybe so they can have a bar or bat mitzvah and make their grandparents really happy. Um, but in general, the message the parents go is, well, I suffered through Hebrew school, so you're going to suffer just like I did. That's just what a part of what it means to be Jewish today. So I don't think anything that I've said there is going to shock you. You've heard it all before. And for many of the listeners out there, um, this is something you might be confronting on a more regular basis. But like, what's your gut reaction when, when someone's coming at you saying like, they're really talking about what's, what's your passion and what's your drive? Like, how do you respond when you hear that sort of mantra taking place? Well, first of all, I would say your your predecessor at the BJE of New York, Samson Benderly, like back in the early 1900s, described the failure of Sunday schools and how uh, anyone could see that they were an institution that was not going to survive. So I'd say that, you know, there's a first piece of it, which is, you know, why why is this institution that's such a failure managing to to stick around for so long like if it's so broken like wh what how is it what it must be serving some sort of need so yeah maybe there is some sense that for some families it's um serving serving child care purposes or or you know it's just a way to get a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah but i don't think that that's really true of people who are choosing to send their kids to supplementary schools anymore i think that the stereotype of I hated it, so you're gonna hate it too, just doesn't reflect the reality of the current situation because it's very, very easy to not send your kid to a supplementary school. I'd say it's very hard to make the choice to send your kid to a day school if it's you know very expensive, um, but I don't know that uh, people People are actively saying like, you know, this is, was a waste of my time, so it's gonna be a waste of yours. I think that by and large, if you talk to parents of children at supplementary schools, they're really happy. They really feel like there's innovative, creative work happening in the school environment, that it's um, pushing the envelope of what's possible. And David, if I may say a word about my colleagues in this field, I mean, imagine any other industry besides teachers and supplementary school teachers who in the course of one week, a hundred days ago, after years of saying, you know, what we offer is community. So that's what we have that's an advantage over online learning, revolutionized the, everything they were doing in order to put everything online in the course of one week and did it in a way that everybody says they're seeing great attendance in their programs, that they're seeing happy 
families, that people who like left the places where they were living in order to continue to stay involved stayed in in in, in order to continue, you know, as a result that they stayed involved. Uh, I, I I think that we need to look more closely at what's actually happening, and maybe say there's some tired old tropes that just reflect what we would like to say and not what's actually the the reality. So can I just say, like, I spoke to a group of New York-based Jewish educators yesterday, even. Um, they were all people that run um, Hebrew schools all around the city. And like, it was it was pretty inspiring to hear, like, no one was prepared for corona. Like, let's just be honest. Like, maybe someone saw it coming, whatever, Steve Jobs sort of stuff. But, like, in general, the education world was not prepared for this. The remarkable ability of people and schools to transform literally overnight needs to really be held up as a real model um, for some of the most nimble Jewish educators um, that I have seen demonstrate such proficiency. Um, I'm trying to work out what they all have in common, like what made those that were so successful pivoting online so quickly. Um, it might surprise none of you. Many of them went to Jewish summer camp or many of them went to Jewish youth group where like the nature of their work is often to be flexible and just deal with what's given to you. Um, but in general, their capacity just to be able to show um, strength in this moment has been really, really, um, really remarkable. And I think it's really important. Um, David, I also, I'd, I'd want to say this was a national thing. I mean, like within a week of this happening, I was in conversations with people all around the country who were openly sharing, how are you doing this? What are you doing for your prayer experience? How exactly do you run a Zoom breakout group? What, what are the ways that you're making this experience works so that you're still focused on community? How do you run a Kahoot? I mean, the number of things that people were talking about was incredible. And then like, I mean, you, you mentioned like kind of how people had to pivot just a few weeks ago, all the educators did it again after the death of George Floyd. All of a sudden, every Jewish educator that I knew working in a supplementary school was in the process of creating resources, conversations, book groups, everyone. Now, yes, there were many of us who already had some knowledge about this, but I'm going to bet that there are a fair percentage who weren't even sure what Juneteenth was three weeks ago. And this Friday are organizing something for Juneteenth because we understand how important it is to capture this moment in time. And that's what I mean when I say that Jewish educators are connecting the past and the future by really being present in the, the experience of the here and now and saying there is Jewish wisdom that is our heritage that we want to make sure is our legacy as well. So um, it would be remiss of me at this point in time not to at least acknowledge the work of my own staff and colleagues um, in this moment in time as well who have conducted over 100 webinars, reaching over 5,500 Jewish educators, um, literally teaching them everything from how to log on to Zoom to how to, de how to deal with racism in American society, how to get your preschool kids attached to Israel around Yom Ha'atzmaut, to how do you do prayer on, on in a virtual platform. So. Like, this has been an ongoing discussion. Yeah, David, I'll fell for you there as well. I'll, I'll call out Greg Alpert by name as somebody who, like, spent hours on, on teaching my team how to use Zoom. I mean, I'd say that 90% of what we're doing now is predicated on conversations we had with Greg. So that was a huge thing that Jewish Education Project contributed. So, I mean, I hear you and I believe you. Why doesn't the funding world step up? This was actually a question that we had come in on our Facebook chat the other day. And I really want to know that if you're so passionate and you believe what you're saying to such an extent, and, and I also believe what you're saying 95% um, of the time, right? We'll talk about the 5% in a second, right? Um, but why aren't the foundations of this world who now are really uh, investing so much in this, in, in this Jewish education enterprise why aren't individual philanthropists standing up and saying, this is where the majority of our kids are at, when good Jewish educators are in place, when the good communities are happening, why aren't more people in the philanthropic world standing up and saying, we want to invest further in congregational learning? Well, David, this, this might be a question that you're more qualified to answer than I am, but I would offer a few hypotheses. One would be that the funders may believe that um, individual congregations are responsible for their own fundraising. And because they have their own donor base, 
that those are the people who should be funding the educational systems in their own institutions. I would also say that I've watched together with you funders get cold feet like after funding research into what could be the next step for supplementary schools and bringing in experts and having focus groups deciding that you know it wasn't what they were looking for it wasn't it was too jewish it wasn't jewish enough it was a different kind of thing than what they wanted um you know I, I, supplementary schools deal with real jewish people like the supplementary schools are where you're going to encounter interfaith families. They're where you're going to, not as much as you should, but will encounter people of color, where you're going to encounter people uh, of, who, of, of all different backgrounds, of, of people of different uh, family uh, uh, languages. And not as much as you should, um, I would say that, you know, we're only starting to see LGBTQ people in leadership positions in supplementary schools over over the course of my own career in ways that don't don't even make sense to me. But that I think is a big piece of it as well is, you know, to what degree are people saying supplementary schools, they're not they're they're not Jewish enough for what we're trying to accomplish. Or we're not sexy enough, you know, we're too old an institution. I'm I'm curious whether whether you have a sense of why that is. It's a, it's a, look. It's a conversation that you and I and others have been having for a long time. And I want to um, and I, let's go here for a second. What happens if the Hebrew school itself, the congregational school itself, is excellent? You put the exact right professional in place. You've put the you've got the right parent body. You've got the right lay committee. But there's something about the congregation per se that doesn't allow real in innovation and transformation to take place. So let's let's just uncouple that for a second. If the membership model of a congregation is so dependent on X number of kids going through Hebrew school and having a bar and bat mitzvah in order to keep as many families engaged in that body, in order to um, maintain the, the financial cash flow of a synagogue situation, then any rabbi or any executive director of a congregation is going to be nervous of change because they've got a model which actually it sort of works or it's not broken enough to really warrant being fixed. So if a clergy member who has a lot of control in one of these situations doesn't want to um, bring about change, why should they? So I'm wondering, is there something inherent in the system of the congregation that doesn't allow for some of these innovations and changes to actually take place meaning that the status quo is good enough to get by with. Now, unfortunately, the data is showing that right now, the decrease of enrollments in Hebrew schools and in congregations is going down. So maybe we're getting to a point now where status quo is not going to be good enough for anyone. But I do wonder how much of it is the system actually holding you back from unleashing all of your creativity. Oh, we're really getting into it now. I love it. Um, I... I so I have so many things that I'd want to say in response to that. First of all, the kind of like bargain that was struck with congregations to be like, we're going to be the centers of, you know, barm bot mitzvah. So JCCs are going to get shut out and summer camps are going to get shut out. And, you know, that that is changing. So I think we will have to see uh, uh, how congregations will react to that. I think all institutions are intrinsically conservative. Um, I've been very lucky at Emmanuel to kind of be the innovation arm of my congregation. And, and it's a congregation that now has other aspects that are really looking to try and rethink. The Stryker Center is an excellent example of uh, a part of our institution that's looking to rethink adult Jewish learning. Um, so I, I do think that you, you may be right that there are some structural impediments to innovation in a congregational setting. That being said, I don't know to what degree we celebrate all the places where that is, there is real change happening and things really do look different. Um, also, I would say for me as an educator, I see supplementary school as just one piece of a much larger landscape. The families that we're working with, 
many times send their kids to summer camps. They participate in youth groups and programs that are movements. Um, the teachers often work at day schools. Uh, we're, we're thinking about adult ed. So I, I wish we talked more about what's the role of supplementary school in this broad landscape of Jewish education that incorporates young family, nursery school education, that incorporates the kind of learning that grandparents are doing and other seniors and says, so what's the particular expertise or the particular piece that supplementary school should be playing in that larger territory? And maybe I'm having too much fun here, but um, all right, so now talking about role of congregations in American life, um, because um, I'm fascinated by spirituality, I'm fascinated by prayer, I'm fascinated by God or the absence of God in some of your conversations. Like, are we are we actually trying to raise a generation of young people in these schools um, for Judaism that they're actually not going to experience um, or that they're not going to choose to experience? So are we actually giving them the real relevancy that you spoke about before or are we actually giving them a, a type of Jewish um, Jew, a Judaism or Jewish experience that we would like them to participate in? Like, I remember I went to a Hebrew school once and the highlight of the actual uh, the day event was teaching them all, and these were progressive um, reform students, um, how to pray the afternoon service of Mincha. Um, and they did it with like such, I don't know, enthusiasm maybe, but like I said, these kids aren't going to be praying Mincha for the rest of their lives, or are they? But is this the most relevant thing we want to be teaching these kids today? Um, Talk to me about prayer. Well, I mean, first of all, what do you make of the, you know, the staff at Ramah Nayak who like can't wait to do Mincha and that's who the cool kids are, the staff people who stick around to do Mincha. And, you know, did any of them have a congregational upbringing or how did they fall in love with Mincha? Um, and I'd also say a piece of this answer goes back to your last question, which is the job of synagogues is so diverse. Like rabbis have to do so many different things be pastoral care, leadership, fundraising. You know, part of the problem is just synagogues are so busy and trying to do so many things that it's hard to say, oh, we're going to put education out in the center and make that the most important purpose for our institution's funding. Um, I think there is a particular role that congregations play. As you said, I think it's the role that God and prayer uh, play. That's a particular thing that synagogues are offering that I think we would not assume that a JCC would necessarily offer. Uh, clearly, there are other places in Jewish educational life that offer it as well, but that seems to be a primary role, the synagogue as a Beit Tefillah, a house of prayer. And I think that a synagogue school has a particular responsibility to be thinking about questions of uh, theology and, and the life of spirituality of, its, of all of its members, but in particular the students. Okay. So I'll just give you one example. Um, in, over the past, you know, two months, we raised with our question, students the question, where is God during this pandemic? You know, is God paying attention? Like, does God know that there's a pandemic going on right now? Is, if, if, is God able to act in response to this pandemic? What are, are there ways that we can see God in action right now? Uh, I think that synagogues that aren't asking questions like that are perhaps missing the point of what it is that a synagogue can contribute that maybe we can't assume would happen elsewhere in the Jewish lives of, of, of Jewish people. So I think one of the things that you're touching on here, but I think is worth just mentioning and naming, um, we're going to get out of this pandemic eventually. And when we get out of the pandemic, we're going to try and either go back to the normal that once was, or we're gonna try and create what people are now calling this new normal. Um, and I think from that, we're gonna to have to ask us, what are some things that we've learned now that will inform us moving forward? And the number one thing on my list is the amazing role that parents, and in some family situations, grandparents, are playing in the education of their children, because now is the first time that you're actually able to sit next to your child and see how they actually learn. Now, you might say that Zoom is artificial, it's not a real classroom, but the insights that I'm getting into the way my children learn now is beyond anything I could ever have imagined. And I'm wondering what you're thinking, um, or your, has your thinking changed at all about what the role of parents could be 
as again, the old stereotype, the parent just drops their kid off at synagogue at Hebrew school so they can have two hours for themselves. There seems to be something that could be changing here. And I'm wondering what your, your feeling is about the family involvement in kids' Jewish education today. Yeah, so I'd say there's a diversity of responses, right? Because just like there are the parents who would rather stick around over the course of the rest of the morning and do Torah study instead of dropping their kids off, um, there are the parents who are happy to put their kid in front of this screen that they know is values driven the way that they might feel comfortable putting their kids in front of Sesame Street. And then they are going to go off and do their Zoom meeting or clean the bathroom or do any of the other things that parents have to do while their kids are in the same apartment that they're in. Um, it, there's opportunity in Zoom. There's no question. Um, there's also a lot of loss. I think people are feeling, you know, really a sense of of missing being together with other people in person. People are missing singing in harmony together with other people. Um, people are missing physical contact with other people. That's not just parents and kids. That's also people who live alone, I think, are in particular feeling this this real sense of loss right now. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we're all asking ourselves, those of us who work in education in any way, is when we go back in person in the next step, what pieces of what we were doing before will we even be able to continue doing in the short term? Will we be able to approach one another? Will we be able to sing together? Um, if the best things that we did, the things that we offered in person were all the things that you couldn't do over Zoom, uh, how are we going to be able to do them if we're no longer allowed to do those things in person? But, but I'll stay on your question, David. What are some of the positives about Zoom? I mean, clearly, everybody now recognizes that everybody can do broadcast media, that broadcast media isn't just reserved for HBO and for Netflix. You know, here we are, look at what we're doing. We just created TV studios in our, in our apartments to talk to each other. Not the most fascinating thing, watching our two faces pop at each other, but Jewish educators are doing amazing things, figuring out what to put on the screen to keep people engaged and to make it meaningful engagement. So, um, firstly, audience out there, your chat box now is going crazy. You're writing so many great things in there. But I do urge you also to pose a question to myself or, or Saul here. We're happy to answer a few questions as well. So uh, if you want to go to the Q&A box, please do that. Saul, I don't want you to be a prophet, but make a prediction here. What's going to happen at the end? Are we all going to rush back to being in contact with one another? Or is digital here to stay? Or is it something in between? I mean, digital was already here. Like this, this is not actually something new. What's different is is how widespread it is right now. Um, there were already plenty of congregations that had a digital component to our learning. We were already doing one-on-one -on -one Hebrew as a bonus for anyone in the religious school who wanted it, uh, in addition to what we were doing in person. Um, I think the question is just where is people's attention going to be? Um, are they going to want to keep on looking at a screen when they no longer have to? Or are they going to say, because of the convenience, I can do this in the car, I can do this you know, in my country house, uh, I can do this while I'm in transition from one thing to another, it, it's, it's worth our continuing to do this. There are a lot of opportunities that are opened up through virtual learning. Some of them people were already doing. Um, you know, bringing together students in Israel with students in the United States, despite the time zone differences. People were already doing that. I think hopefully we'll see more things that look like that. Um, is it going to completely replace in-person learning? I think unless we're, we're not having in-person experiences at all, I don't, I don't think so. We've already seen people try to create Jewish learning in Minecraft and in other kind of online spaces using Discord servers for, for a long while now. And I think if we're stuck in, in our apartments, you're gonna see more and more attempts to make that work. But I do think people will want to be together in person in some fashion. It'll ultimately, David, frankly, be about just how difficult and challenging does in-person look? And is it that it's you know so complicated to make it work as a parent that I say, I'd rather just go for the convenience of, of online learning? So let's, let's, let's be honest with our listeners here, not that we haven't been up until now, but at least say, we don't know what the future is gonna be in the fall. And as I say to my staff now, as we're preparing um, over the summer for the fall, there are really three scenarios that we're dealing with. One is that our students will go back to school in September. 
August, some parts of the country. Our students will not go back in September and therefore they will continue doing um, some sort of online learning. Um, of course, option one also involves subcategories of hybrid learning. You might not fully go back. So option one is go back in September. Option two is don't go back in September. And option three is you go back in September, but there's a second wave pandemic and then we go back out. Um, a few people have asked these questions. Let's just role play it for one second. Um, you decide that your, um, your fall semester is going to be online because that's what you've decided is important for the health and well-being of your congregants. Um, and parent comes to you and says, uh, it's not worth it for me to sign up for Hebrew school this semester because um, it's only online. My kid's on Zoom all day. Like, I'm going to give this semester a break until you, um, until you decide to come back in person. Now, by the way, this is taking place all around the country with academic institutions when students by the, the thousands we're hearing about now are deciding not to pay their uh, university tuition and taking a gap year because they don't want that online experience. But you're the ed director. I say to you as parent, not worth it. I'm going to take a semester off. What do you say? I mean, no one is more prepared for that question than supplementary school educators because we've had a long history of answering the question, my kid is in soccer four days a week. We can't spare time for religious school. What are you going to do to make it work for my kid? I mean, there's nobody, as you've seen over the past months, who's more flexible and more creative than religious school principals. So. First of all, I think a good number of us are going to have online options for students. I know that's something that Emmanuel is going to offer because we've already heard. We've got families that just don't know if they're going to be back in a local way in the fall. And they want to continue to maintain the connection with the synagogue and with their learning that they're having here. Um, so there'll be and and you have to keep in mind that it's not as it's not as clear as like everybody's in for september october goes out for november it could be an individual school is in for october and is out in november it could be an individual pod of students in an individual school is in for october and out in november it could be an individual family was exposed to coronavirus the kid is healthy but they can't come back into the school situation and so they have to be doing learning online i think the real question that we have to grapple with is going to be what can we offer in person that can't be done online and what can we do online that can't be done in person i think we're going to have real hybrids you know this again it's going back to something that the bureau of jewish education did back in benderley's time of like sending like boxes home to families for family engagement you know i don't know if you know this but the song i have a little dreidel was commissioned by the bje of new york on an lp that was sent out to families all over new york city in order that people could keep on doing hanukkah together with their kids uh you know, here in here in America. So I, I think that there's really a, uh, a a real possibility here, David, for collaboration like we've never seen before, because if you're creating a box at your congregation and I'm creating a box at my congregation, we're, why not say let's work on the same box and then we'll brand it, you know, for our own congregations. If the values we're teaching, the lessons we're teaching are ultimately the same. And let me also say for virtual teachers, this is an incredible opportunity for people to become teachers in all around the country. You could be a teacher from four in the afternoon to 11 o'clock in the evening if you're a virtual teacher, just by teaching in different time zones as the evening goes on. Okay. Bingo. And now I think you've hit one of the, e the earlier questions as well. Because when a funder is looking at trying to invest in a field, they don't want to invest in a thousand individual institutions doing their own thing. Um, and in some ways, I think you're pointing towards collaboration. If we could find a way to bring together the collective energy of a whole lot of people, this would make it a far more attractive proposition for people who want to develop a whole field. So I think it's something worth considering the territorial nature of institutional Jewish life of the 20th century no longer exists. And if we're to understand anything from this pandemic, digital education knows no geographic boundaries. And if we can't react fast enough to that, we can't complain if the rest of the world just leapfrogs us um, ahead of time. I want to move on to the conversations to, to a completely different area that you touched on before, but I think this is really important. Um, you spoke about George Floyd and the murder of George Floyd. Um, and I don't think it's just that, the, that incident. Um, creating global citizens or creating a, a strong, upstanding American citizens um, 
would you be bold enough to say that that is um, a specific articulated goal of Jewish education today? David, the biggest problem with Jewish education is you can't really define Jewish education because you can't really define Jewish and you can't really define education. If you get any two people in a room together, they're going to disagree on what we're talking about. Do I think that every institution that says that they're doing Jewish education is prepared to acknowledge the, the racist implications of the xenophobic implications, the homophobic implications, the gender misogynist implications of, of a lot of traditional Jewish wisdom? I mean, for sure not. Of course, of course you're going to see people who are afraid to do that, but I think you're also going to see, and I'm so glad to be a, one of the people who, who's, who's a part of this, uh, you're gonna see people who are saying, we have a moment in time now where we can call into question some of our heritage and say, there are things there are ways in which we have benefited from, from, from language, from teachings, from, from that, 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 that are simply, we no longer are comfortable with them anymore. We're, we're not ready to move into a future that incorporates this is our way of life. And I think anyone who, who reads Torah or reads Talmud and isn't made uncomfortable by reading about slavery and the history, reading like the, the regulations for Jews as slave owners, and in some way says, well, that's not me, that's not my family, I never benefited from that personally. That's simply not true. Of course you benefited from that personally. You, you've inherited that. Uh, if you, unless you are one of the people who was excluded as a result of that, or one of the people who w was, you know, who, who experienced the racism and, and, and uh, as a result of that, then you're one of the people who's benefited from it. And we all need to acknowledge that and we all need to look at the ways that our institutions can actually rethink how we're operating. And, and I think this is a moment in time, not just around racism, but around the whole Me Too is another issue that I think is, we're in the midst of a moment around that I, I hope is really going to make a difference for the future. Talk to me about teacher training then. Now, uh, not specifically at Emmanuel, it's a bit of a different model than most Hebrew schools, but if you are trying to describe what ideal educator training looks like or could look like, um, what would it begin to look like to address these issues, other issues? I mean, I think it's one of the biggest problems with my conversations with you and my previous guests, but no matter how many times we talk about these issues and raise to a certain level, there just doesn't seem to be enough of a pipeline of trained Jewish educators who are able to fulfill some of these conversations. And as amazing it is that all these people are online joining us every week, we probably need 10 times that amount to be able to at least start really having a, a change in, in, in momentum here. But what do you think about educated training or Jewish educated training at the moment? I mean, you got to be careful here because I'm going to give you a very dorky and passionate answer to this because this is what I'm doing my doctoral research on. Um, but I think a lot of what we're talking about is how do we make sure that when training happens, it incorporates real life experiences that are teaching experiences that incorporate elements of diversity in the experience of, of teaching um, that involve being challenged to reconsider your, your presuppositions, whatever they are, re recon you know, reconsider your, your uh, hypocrisies and assumptions of all kinds and then have a safe space that you can come back to where you can consider those together with other people um, and go have a dialogue between those real life experiences of practice and the kind of more heady experiences of theory that, that help you to, to, to guide you in what you're doing in those moments. And I wish there were more opportunities for conversation that involved like people in different roles in different institutions so that you could see yourself as a youth group advisor becoming a, a religious school principal and you could see yourself as a full-time teacher in a day school uh, becoming the head of the day school or becoming the, the head of a summer camp there there just there just isn't enough opportunity to bring people together in different roles in the field for people to even believe that there's any kind of track you could be on and they're, listen, people like you and, and, and I, we 
have been mentored so well. Like we could name a long list of people that we wouldn't be doing this work if it weren't for the ways that they supported us earlier on in the, our careers. And I don't know about you, but I have at every, every point in my career tried to make sure anyone who I was supervising had the opportunity to go out and, and, and leave, leave my supervision, to go do something bigger and better that I, I wasn't involved with and, and, and continue to be my colleague in another organization. I feel so grateful to have so many of those people as friends now. Yeah, I think you're hitting on something which is really important here. And that is um, one of the reasons why um, there are not enough people being trained as Jewish educators or not receiving the quality type of Jewish educational experiences because there's no obvious trajectory. There's not an obvious growth pattern. Um, you know, it's impossible to believe that every summer there are 10,000 plus um, young adult counselors at summer camp who have not given the opportunity we want to continue a career in Jewish education. But um, let's be honest. Um, if there's no if there's no way to make a living, or if there's no salary increments, or there's no way that you can um, you can potentially see this as a career path, it's just not going to happen. And here's where we're beginning to talk about systems and the and the system could be um, broken, except you only recognise something's broken when it reaches rock bottom. Now, I don't want to get to that stage, but when I look at the lack of people coming through the system and predicting what happens when X number of the population who are Jewish educators retire in the next couple of years, we're gonna see major segments of the Jewish educational community um, that are really deficit of people um, to do those jobs. And I think it's a real calling out um, for organizations like ourselves and for other people out there as what we can be doing. I wanna- uh, David, uh, David, I wanna say to that, that we should both acknowledge also the number of young people who are taking on entrepreneurial kinds of roles in Jewish education and Jewish life that are not simply filling positions that already existed that, you know, others who are older are leaving, um, but are actually rethinking what Jewish education should look like or could look like and are creating all sorts of really interesting new approaches to Jewish education. By the way, I also, I just want to say, I love the chat box that's going on in this conversation. Like, I'm just like, I'm seeing little flashes of it. I want to have that conversation with every single one of you. It's like, I kind of, I'm feeling so torn. And the David's a really is interesting coming. guy that everybody's saying such great things in the chat. I know. And the Q&A is coming through are also really worth paying attention to. People are asking um, about paying tuition. And the, I think implied there is the economic downturn after COVID or now even during COVID with such high unemployment rates. Like um, what are the economics of Jewish education going to look like? People are talking about kids with learning issues and how they're going to like, not everyone is capable of learning on Zoom in the same way. And what are we doing about differentiated learning? Um, people are talking about almost like a whiplash sensation of like hybrid here, online here, blended here. Like, it's, is it actually possible or feasible? Um, I do think it also just boils down to like, sometimes we just have to align our expectations. Like you can't hold up the same expectations for Jewish day school as you do for congregational school and say, well, one's not as successful because it doesn't achieve the same set of goals. Like, you know, the dosage alone would mean that you're going to be able to achieve different amounts of things. So I think there's a lining up of expectations, which is important. But, but, let it, but let's let's challenge what you just said. Let's challenge that assumption, right? Like, so what is it that, it, I mean, are we saying that everyone who graduates from a day school then leads a committed Jewish life and everyone who graduates from a supplementary school is less likely to because of the fewer hours of learning that they had, the fewer hours of Jewish community that they had? I mean, I think that there's... I I am I'm, I really wonder about that, David. Yeah. I think that I we're talking about commitment. I do think we're talking about literacy, which is a conversation we've had a few times. Like, what what's the Jewish literacy you would like a congregational graduate to have is going to be different to a day school grad, but um maybe not. I I mean clearly the literacy that we want any Jew to have is the desire to keep on studying Jewish text and and to be engaging in Jewish life with like minded people. You know, my concern is that people are going to be good human beings and that they're going to have Judaism as a particular as a particular technology to make that possible. There's going to be specific Jewish rituals that are going to help them to gather together with other like minded people in doing value driven action. And, you know, I, I would, while there may be people who celebrate Shabbat more knowledgeably, who come from one background or another, I would hope that everyone 
who has been touched by Jewish education understands the necessity for a sacred pause and of stopping to reflect, but of not saying my whole life looks like Shabbat. My whole life looks like, you know, convenience and ease. I have six days a week of trying to make the world a better place. And then I have one day a week where I pause and I say, I'm going to pretend the world is already the way that I want it to be. We could say the same about Sadaka. You know, a day school student may have a lot more familiarity with, let's say, Maimonides' Larity Ladder, right? Maybe they do. But should a day school student be more cognizant than a religious school student or a Jewish summer camp person or a youth group person, my own background, where I got the excitement from, to say tzedakah is more than just giving compassionately, it's also trying to create equity in the world. That's core to what we're trying to accomplish as Jews. All right. A couple of short answers because we're coming into time here. Um, what's something you've been reading, Saul, or you've read that you think all Jewish educators or people involved in Jewish education should have a read of? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Everyone should read my qualifying paper for my, uh, for my, for my dissertation. Like qualifying paper, anything that comes to mind? You know, I mean, I, I have to be honest, like I've been so focused on the doing in Jewish right now that the input has not been particularly Jewish. I just read a great young adult novel by Mala Nunn uh, called When the Ground Gets Hard. She's an uh, Australian author from Swaziland. I, I totally recommend it. Uh, when the Ground Gets Hard, it's called. Um, I'm currently reading The City We Became by N.K. Jameson, kind of New York City science fiction. Wholeheartedly recommend it. My daughter, Jory, who's 12 and I, are kind of racing through it together. We each have our own bookmark. Okay. All right, so pay tribute to one of those mentors or educators that made a difference in your life. I mean, there's so many. I would certainly talk about Jeff Serkman, who's a rabbi up at Larchmont Temple now, you know, and he was the religious school principal at Beth Elohim, where I grew up in Park Slope. Um, you know, he really, he was the first person. I, I remember my brother, my younger brother, Mark, was kind of like, you're not going to believe this, but I've got a teacher this year who's really, really good and really interesting. You would like him. And the next year he became the principal and hired me to be, you know, like a, one of the teacher's aides. And that was a big piece of what, what got me set in doing this. A lot of creativity. So let me, let me try and wrap all of this conversation up, recognizing that we've only begun a conversation that's clearly taking place in real time in the chat box and in other places as well. Um, we're at a moment in time now where we are acting in many ways in what I've described to my team as a bit of triage. Yet we are trying to react to all of the needs that the Jewish people need right now from us. And we're trying to give them what they need or what they think they need. At a certain point in time, there is going to be a transformation when we're beginning to able to create the future of when we come out of this pandemic. Look, that's what the Jewish education project is about. That's why we have this live cast um, series going on. Because if you realize and you look behind the answers that Saul was giving today, many of them seem like technical responses, hybrid, blended, this, that, involved. Not in What's taking place here is much more significant. And that's why we called the series Adapting, because the real problems that we're trying to grapple with now are not the quick fixes and the easy solutions. The things which are going to cause us the most challenging moments moving forward are those which are really going to push us and struggle. And when we change and when we adapt and when we innovate, some things are not going to be maintained. That's why when you're talking about adaptive leadership, you've got to recognize what loss actually means. Status quo is there for a reason. If the status quo is going to change, it means that some things that we've all grown accustomed to are not going to be the ones that continue into the future. And that's why brave leadership is necessary. But I think today in thanking Saul, I also want to really say now is the time for us to be able to take some risks. Not just the people like Saul and the educators that I met with yesterday and those of you who I know so well here. But for the entire community to say, we're at a point in history where our people demand us to take some risks and meet the challenges head on and really be able to confront this new, this new reality that we're living in right now. And as I said to my team yesterday, um, there's something called the new normal out there. And so far, everyone's thrusting this new normal upon us. But now is the time for us to create the new normal in which we want to exist, for us to gain control over that which we're doing. And in thanking Saul, I really want to just say that you are really one of the people that I look to 
who is really, really carrying the torch to bring this field forward. I'm really one of the congregational educators that I admire so much and so glad to have had this conversation with you um, today. I do also want to make mention that next week, we are going to have some of our Young Pioneer Award winners. Well, officially, the Jewish Education Project's Robert M. Sherman Young Pioneer Award winners join us, who in many ways represent that trajectory of Jewish educators that I was referring to before. They really are some dynamic, really inspiring educators, and I encourage you all to come back next week. I want to thank Nessa, Greg, Karen, and Gabe, who are working behind the scenes. I want to thank UJA Federation of New York. We're also going through some challenging times right now, but are continually there as our supporter and partner in all of the work that we do. But finally, I really want to thank Saul. Um, transparent, open, brave, courageous, dealing with technical glitches. Um, I'm really glad that you were able to join us today. Maybe a final word from Saul before we sign off. Uh Look, I mean, you all know the story of Honey the Circle Maker, right? You know, he planted, the, saw the planted carob trees that, you know, were planted in the world for him so that he, and he said, we got to plant carob trees for the future. That's, that's what Jewish education is, my friends. We got to be thinking 70 years from now, what do we want this world to look like? What is the world that we want for our grandkids? Not what the world do the grandparents want. What do 20 somethings want for the grandparents? And it's our job to bring that world into existence. The, the, if you can't plant a carob tree, plant an apple tree. You know, we, we got we to gotta think about what we're doing to, to keep this thing going so that the world will keep on getting better and better. But we, and we can note, do it together. On that note, really, thank you to Saul. Thanks to all our listeners out there. Um, and I'll see you all same time next week. Thanks, everybody.